pleased to bring you our feature presentation. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and we're cracking open another bottle of wine because tomorrow is National Wine Day, and who keeps this holiday to be a single day? No, sir. Here in the basement, we're celebrating our own National Wine Day weekend, and to start, we're featuring special guest from Trust Tree Financial, certified financial planner, Brandon Opry. Plus, from Afford Anything, Paula Pant. And from LenPenzo.com, it's Arya Stark. No, I'm actually not even sure if she's still alive. Hey, can anyone tell me about Aria? Like, is she still around or... Really? That? Oh, okay, all right. Don't give it away. Right. Apparently, we're stuck with Len Penzo. And in our Friday FinTech segment, we're throwing out the FinTech and talking vacation. Non-tech. To round out our coverage of holiday travel fun, we'll talk Disney tips and tricks with Money Millhouse's Bethany Bayless. But that's not all. Of course, we'll save time for my amazing trivia and help one listener magnify and solve their money issue. And now, the official cork popper on this podcast, Joe Saul Seahawk. We are popping the cork, and it's fr- It's a long weekend if you're in the United States. Happy Memorial Day weekend to all of you in the U.S. For all of you abroad, happy Friday. <laughs> And to help us celebrate, let's start off uh, in a bunker under Los Angeles, where I believe our friend Len Penzo is waiting. How you doing, Joe? I'm great, man. What are you doing Memorial Day weekend? Uh, I'm going to sit here in my bunker and probably watch some golf. <laughs> that is a, watch, watch what people do above ground. That's your, that's your whole thing. <laughs> Watch people with sticks above ground. I live ground. vicariously through the golfer. That's how I get, you know, I exercise my eyes. You well, know, they just go. Would it actually be exciting for you if there was like a nuclear bomb going off in the background while you're watching golf? <laughs> and you know that you're safe from all that stuff? Well, it would be, uh, you know, it's it's kind of a mixed bag. <laughs> it's a mixed blessing, I guess, isn't it? <laughs> mixed blessing. <laughs> That is so bad. And a person who's much more than a mixed blessing on this podcast. This is that's a horrible segue from uh, Las Vegas. It's our friend Paula Pant. So I have a question. How is it wine day weekend? Isn't that self-contradictory? Is it a wine day or is it a wine weekend? It really is wine day year. Like if we want to be really contradictory, but isn't every day (laughs) wine day? Wine day lifetime. <laughs> That's exactly it. Wine day decade. <laughs> now, I know that Paula has big uh, Memorial Day plans. You're probably getting all crazy this Memorial Day. I totally am. I'm going to Camp Mustache in Seattle so that I can hang out with a bunch of financial independence people and we can talk about not having jobs. And then after that, uh, which which I guess makes Memorial Day like just any other weekend when you aren't employed. And then after that, I'm going down to Portland because, heck, why not? I don't have a job. <laughs> it's a, that is like a weekend. That sounds like it's going to be, what, two weeks? It's going to be a week, actually. Yeah, my, my, my Memorial Day weekend is stretching for a week, and I'm going to Seattle and Portland. That's awesome. And joining us today, our special guest, a guy who thinks it's been a week already since the show started. He's like, what are we doing here? It's, it's our new friend, Brandon Opry. Brandon, how are you, man? Awesome. Thanks for having me on. Well, tell everybody about your business, about the business. Oh, let's see. It's nothing too exciting. I mean, I've been in the financial industry for 22 years, and basically I talk to people about money, uh, specifically uh, doing financial planning and investment management and helping people work towards financial freedom. And you're mostly in, uh, in Florida, in the Southeast. Where are you mostly located? I'm all over the place. Uh, I did spend the last 20 years in Florida. Uh, Most recently, uh, my family and I bought a house in Charlotte, so we're spending a lot of time here. But I have clients all over the country, and I do a lot of traveling to go meet with them. Nice. And you work with people using technology, too, I'd imagine. Thank God for technology. I can uh, do this the right way. Well, the cool thing about technology is you don't have to spend a lot on clothing. But when you do, you want to look good, don't you, Brandon? Yes. uh, But oftentimes, I'm 
walking into my office in, uh, you know, gym clothes or a t-shirt and jeans. And, uh, that feels pretty good too. But you should totally stop that because we have to thank proper cloth for supporting Stacky Benjamins. <laughs> <laughs> proper cloth makes it easy for Brandon to buy dress shirts that fit perfectly without setting foot in a store, or paying a fortune, get $20 off your first custom shirt at propercloth.com slash SB. And we are also today uh, brought to you by Ting. Thanks to Ting for supporting Stacky Benjamins. No, Len, we didn't say Tang. We said Ting. L- Len's thinking, uh, what, early 70s orange drink? <laughs> no. Not that. I'm still excited about that. Uh, what was it proper cloth? Is that what you called it? It is. It's proper cloth. Yeah. Will, will that hide my beer belly? It absolutely. You know what? Well, you, get your I, you know what? I might. I'm going to, I might have to look into that. Isn't that? What's that joke? It's not a beer belly. It's a protective coating for your abs of steel. <laughs> is that what it really is? Well, uh, that's a good one. I'm going to have to start using. <laughs> Well, Ting It'll is properly a, hide it. That's right. Ting is a protective coating for your wireless. I don't. That's bad. With Ting, you pay, pay a fair price for the talk, text, and data you actually use each month. The phone you already own will probably work with Ting, so that's good news. Get twenty five bucks off your phone bill at sb.ting.com. I like how different that is. It's sb.ting. Dot com. We got a great show. We got Brandon here with us. We got Len. We got Paula. We got a holiday weekend. So let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show. Our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our headline today comes to us from The Motley Fool. I found it on Yahoo Finance, though. Seven quotes that will make you rethink your personal finances. And if that isn't Motley Fool clickbait, I don't know what is. So I clicked and then I have three people I can talk to about uh, all of these because I thought we'd just walk through these because these are pretty interesting. Uh, Mr. Frankel starts off with this. He says, one of the best ways to learn about personal finance and investing is to learn from the best. With that in mind, here are seven of my all-time favorite personal finance quotes from top-notch investors, writers, and business people, along with what each one could mean to you. Brandon, we'll start with you with the first one. Apparently, a couple weeks ago, there was this... uh, there was this meetup of finance nerds in Omaha with this guy, Warren Buffett. Uh, I th- what, is that Jimmy's brother? Is that who that is? I heard of him. Buffett says price is what you pay. Value is what you get. Is that one of your favorites also? I mean, Warren Buffett has a lot of great quotes. This is one of many. But uh, this one reminds me of the fee discussion that clients ask advisors like myself too many times they're asking, you know, what's your fee? And they want to compare advisors based on their fee. But I usually have to have them take a step back and refocus on the value that we provide and what they're receiving. And what's the biggest value you think an advisor brings to the table, Brandon? Well, I mean, a lot of it's investor psychology, keeping people from doing stupid things. But that aside, I think advisors can add a lot of value in terms of uh, asset allocation, rebalancing, tax uh, strategies and things of that nature. When did we get to this point, Len, that we, and we do this all the time in the financial community to Brandon's point, we think that cheaper equals better on everything financial. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, you get what you pay for sometimes. Right. And then, yes, I, I think a certified uh, financial planner, uh, they're usually worth their weight in gold, especially if you're in trouble and not uh, having you, you're shown yourself to be unable to control your own finances and and steer them correctly. But it's not just financial planners and everything, Joe, it's everything in life, really. Right. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's everything from the types of stocks you're buying to the jeans you're buying as well. Right. You know, you can go off and buy those designer jeans for 200 bucks and they are going to, uh, you know, even if they last a year or two years, and you can go off and buy a, a regular hearty pair of good quality jeans that might last you longer and, you have a chance to, uh, you know, you can actually beat them harder and, and uh, you, you can get those lasting just as long as you, you've, uh, you can get four pair for one. So, Len, do you go buy a pair of jeans and your wife tells you you look fat in them? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm hoping the, uh, the proper cloth, uh, <laughs> hopefully, you know, when I, when I buy those shirts there, that'll, that'll take care of that problem. But, <laughs> Paula, when it comes specifically, nice job. Thank you. That's good. Uh, when it comes to when it comes not to your clothing, but let's get back to investments. Cheaper and better being equated by a lot of people. 
Well, I mean, it depends on what type of investment you're buying, right? If you're buying a, a broad market index fund, then there's no reason to pay a higher expense ratio for it because you're just buying some passively managed index fund. But if you are paying a human being for financial advice uh, or for financial planning, that's different, right? Because then you're paying somebody for their expertise, for their strategic vision, for the, the actual value that they're going to bring to the table. And so it's very case by case, like the price versus value depends on what specific vertical you're evaluating. To yeah. go back to Len's pants example, yeah, Len gave the analogy of if you're looking for a pair of jeans and what you value is that they're durable, then it might be the case that a $35 pair of jeans is equally as durable as a $200 pair. $200 pair. If you are my, I, I have much greater experience in the world of wearing yoga pants. I can tell you for a fact those Target yoga pants that cost like 20 bucks. Those do not last nearly as long as a hundred dollar pair of Lululemons. So sure, Lululemons, you get criticized for spending a hundred dollars on a pair of pants, but they last more than five times longer. So, you know, I think that's a, a really good example of it's not just price, it's also value. Do Lululemons come in portly size? In, in portly? <laughs> yes. I haven't inquired, but I bet you could go in and ask for a fitting. Can you can you see that at the store? Small, medium, large, portly. <laughs> like there's the portly rack. I'll take one of those. A uh, second one, Paul let's stick with you. Another uh, Warren Buffett quote: "You can't produce a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant." Yeah, this makes a lot of sense to me, right? What essentially what he's saying is there are some things that just take time. And you cannot try to hack your way into a shortcut because those hacks are not going to work. And on paper, they might seem as though they make sense, but they're just not going to work. There are certain things that are going to take time. It seems like, Brandon, that would be a part of your job in a big way is keeping investors patient. Exactly. I mean, uh, too often times people watch the news and they see the latest, greatest IPO come out and they think they can double their money overnight. Um, but I got to, you know, encourage them to pump the brakes a little bit and, uh, you know, talk some sense into um, these people. How do, you, how do you do that? Do you show them data numbers? Is it uh, just holding their hand a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I go back in time and just uh, look at the statistics and, and say, look, this is no indication of what can happen going forward. But uh, it's reasonably predictive. And I'd rather us take the wise choice, the better path, the smarter path to building wealth and um, trying to hit home runs and, you know, swing for the fences. So you're saying it's showing them past performance, like past data on what this market condition has been like before, maybe. Yep. Try to manage expectations and uh, keep them realistic. Does that get hard? Because, you know, you've been around uh, for quite a long time, Brandon. I mean, I've, I've talked to a few people that 2007, 2008 time period. How hard is it to keep people to keep people in line when even as a financial planner, you got to be thinking to yourself, uh, I'm not really sure where this thing's headed. Yeah, you're right. When you're in the middle of a, a storm like that, it definitely doesn't feel good. Uh, you know what you should be doing and you know, you pass that advice on, but I got to tell you, even for myself, it doesn't feel right, but oftentimes you just got to do what is right. And if you bought in 07 and 08 or bought more, uh, it turned out to be the right thing. It's so funny, Len. We read this quote about producing a baby in one month by getting nine women pregnant just to speed it up the process. Yet at this latest meeting, Warren Buffett actually went against this and said that some, I mean, this speaks to delayed gratification, right? And that delayed gratification is probably a good thing. But he told a young investor in Omaha just a couple of weeks ago that delayed gratification sometimes overrated. Like the older he gets, the more he realizes you should maybe do the thing now. Well, let's consider Warren's age, right? I mean, I mean, his perspective's changing, right? I mean, he's what? How old is Warren Buffett? Ninety, or I mean, he's got to be, right? So he doesn't have time. So youth, when you're younger, that's a luxury. You might be broke, but you got time. You have plenty of time to make up for mistakes, for financial mistakes, for downturns in markets. And that is a luxury. And you and I know young people, even when I was younger, you take that for granted. And as you get older, as I am now getting older, I'm seeing things from a different perspective now. Now, I don't have as much time for mistakes. So if I, there's a big mistake or big downturn in the market and, and I've uh, 
held on too long, I don't have a lot of time to recover. So yes, yeah, so it, it kind of all depends on your perspective and how your age. Can I just get some quotes? You know, Jesse Livermore, he's like a very famous investor from the early uh, 20th century. Yeah, yeah. The guy made a lot of money. And he had three famous quotes about sitting tight. And, and one was buy right, sit tight. Another one he had was, it was never my thinking that made big money for me. It was always the sitting, in other words, waiting on a, a you know, he stuck to his convictions and he, and he sat tight regardless of cost. And the third one he has is don't give me timing, give me time. And uh, your listeners, I just look up Jesse Livermore. The guy was a, a brilliant investor in his, in a way ahead of his time. I love those. Let's go on to number three on this list though. And Brandon, I'm going to start with you. Cause when I was a financial planner, this one drove me crazy. Uh, another Buffett quote, predicting rain doesn't count. Building the art does. I can't tell you how many times I would talk to an investor who's like, yeah, I was thinking about doing this thing. And you'd say, well, what have you actually done? Well, I haven't, haven't really done anything, Joe. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this quote uh, specifically reminds me of what I tell my clients that are in Florida uh, because you get a lot of hurricanes there. You know, you can't always predict when the hurricane will come, but inevitably there will be one. So the best you can do now is, you know, make preparations, whether that's hurricane shutters, windows, uh, having a generator, some of those other things, because when the time comes, you're going to like knowing that you're prepared. But it just always seems like we talk about doing things. And I'll give you an example. Online forums often talk about why'd you do this? Because it was only 95 percent right. My feeling is I'd rather do something 95 percent right and get moving than sit around and wait to do the perfect thing. And the same thing goes with your portfolio. I mean, do you want to hit singles and doubles to use my baseball analogy versus, uh, you know, swing for the fences and home runs? I tend to um, work better with people who will take the singles and doubles. Yeah. Paula, you're nodding your head. Yeah. Baseball analogy. That totally resonates. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's a game with a bat <laughs> and a ball and some players. Every single one of the Los Angeles Kings baseball games, Len. <laughs> That Paula goes to, she, right. she really, really loves. Yeah. The next one, uh, P Peter Lynch, uh, who ran a big fund called Magellan for Fidelity for a long time says, if you spend more than 13 minutes analyzing economic and market forecast, you've wasted 10 minutes. What do you think of that one, Len? Actually, I think it's really, it's really a good one. <laughs> don't put a lot, what he's basically saying is don't put a lot of faith uh, into these predictions. I mean, take it with a grain of salt, but don't obsess over these predictions. So they're just predictions. Nobody can predict the future. And uh, there's things that, one of the things I live by all the time is the markets can be irrational much longer than you can stay solvent. So don't try to rationalize anything. Just, uh, you know, just do your homework or listen to your advisor and carry on. Brandon, you get all kinds of data on market forecasts all the time, I would bet. How much time do you spend reading those about where the market's headed tomorrow, next week, next year? Yeah, I mean, it's one thing for me to read through it, and I do. But when it comes to working with people, I try to differentiate you know, financial information versus financial noise. And a lot of the things that we see on TV is really noise. So I think this Peter Lynch quote, you know, he said you wasted 10 minutes. He can also say... You know, you wasted 13 minutes because a lot of times these talking heads on TV are um, inaccurate and sometimes very wrong. Well, and sometimes I think they have an ax to grind. Like it's always shocking to me. And I say that with tongue firmly planted in cheek when a growth fund manager says that the market's poised for super growth right now. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's funny how that works. Right. But my, my favorite example is a couple of years ago when, I don't know what article I was reading, 17 out of 17 professionals in the fixed income market predict higher interest rates by year end. And wouldn't you know that 17 out of 17 were wrong. Uh, interest rates fell by the end of the year. And I thought that was just hilarious. Just awesome. I want to, Paula, end on this one. We don't have time for all these, but we will link to them on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Tennessee Williams, the playwright. You can be young without money, but you can't be old without it. Yeah, which is exactly why saving for retirement is so important. Oftentimes people say, well, I love my job. I don't want to retire or I never plan to retire. The thing is, don't think of it as saving for retirement in the golfing and taking a cruise to the Bahamas sense of the word. 
think of it as saving for retirement as you are taking care of a version of you that is age 60 plus. Because if you are young and broke, that's pro- in most cases not as big of a deal. You are more likely to be in good health. You are more likely to be able to live with roommates, you know, just cut the corners that you need to be able to cut. If you are older and uh, have more specialized needs and more medical needs and you're broke, that's really hard. So basically retirement savings in in large part is just self-insurance against not being broke when you're old. Yeah, they say a big reason, Len, that people retire is not because they want to. It's for medical reasons. You work for a major company. You must have seen this, people leaving not because they want to, but because they really have to. Um, I'll be honest. I can't think of one right now. I, I guess I can, but they were very – they were old, really old. I mean they were 72, 73. So, I mean they were well beyond retirement age. In my industry, <laughs> most people leave <laughs> – they leave prematurely because they get laid off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're seeing people leave because they don't want to as well. They're, they're, yeah, oh, I do. Yeah, they're retiring yeah I might be they... one of those victims too. Here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but 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 not a planned uh, leaving of the company though. Still the same thing. They're not leaving because they want to. That's true. Yeah. Actually, you, you know what? You're you're absolutely right, and and so that's why I tend to be so darn conservative, maybe to a fault. My whole career, I've always been on edge about being laid off at any moment or or what have you. So, um, and, and as you get older, again to to the quote, it's it, the older you get, the less time you have for for mistakes yeah. and to recover. So it, it's um, uh, you know, boy, youth has a lot of advantages, folks. I, I know I know it's hard when you're just starting out and you're just trying. You think you'll never get all that money, but let me tell you that that time is such a wonderful thing. Hey, and guys, before we get to my last question here, which is going to be about your favorite quotes and quotes that you live by, I know a quote uh, that isn't on this list, but is one that should be, a man should look as if he bought all his clothes with intelligence, put them on with care, and then forgotten all about them. That's Hardy Amis who said that. And it's so true, isn't it? Looking great without looking like you spent all day trying to look great for a man, that's a great one. And I'll tell you a company that helps with that because when your clothes fit well, everything in life seems to go well. You're going to ace the interview, the date, whatever else you're trying to do when you want to make a great impression. Proper cloth makes it easy for men to buy dress shirts that fit perfectly without setting foot in a store paying a fortune. And while most bespoke shirts take months to ship, proper cloth delivers your custom clothes in less than two weeks. So head to propercloth.com slash SB. You'll enter a few short questions then and easily get the perfect shirt for your body thanks to their custom size prediction technology. It was amazing, by the way. I did that. They sent my first shirt. I'm wearing it right now. It looks so comfortable. And people, when I talk to them, because I'm talking to people all day long, come into the basement, I can tell I always get this look like, oh, that's a nice shirt. But it also looks like this particular shirt I'm wearing right now looks like a very casual flannel, but it just fits. GQ sums up proper cloth properly, by the way. You could get a dress shirt and have it tailored, but why not buy one made to measure from the comfort of your couch? You'll get $20 off your first custom shirt at propercloth.com slash SB. That's 20 bucks. How about that? That's good. Go to propercloth.com slash SB for your $20 off. I think all of us have kind of a mantra or one of these quotes that we really like. One that I like is from Sun Tzu, the art of war, and that's the best battles, the one that's never fought. That applies and just is applied so often in my life. Paula, what's one, what's a quote that really works for you when it comes to your investing or professional life? Ooh, a little on the spot there. All right. Quote that resonates for professional life. Um, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. <laughs> <laughs> like in this case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, Len, how exactly. about you? Len, how about you? What's one that works for you? 
I don't know if it works for me, but it, it just puts things in perspective for me. And I've already given you the quote. It's it's markets can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. So don't, in other words, the, the, the moral of that story is I know you might think you're correct. You know, you, you say, okay, I know this is how things should be. I think the market's overvalued or what have you, but you got to follow the trend. The trend is your friend. There's another quote. And sometimes you can't get in this bubble and have this tunnel vision or you're going to get you're just going to it's going to hurt you in the long run. So learn from me. I've made mistakes. I've made this mistake. OK, and I'm trying to tell the young kids, don't get hung up on your convictions. You know, you got to look at the trend. You got to look at uh, think the, the markets will be irrational for a long time. So there's a lot of things that, that you got to take into consideration. Yeah. Back to, back to you, Paula, because we're going to give Brandon the last word here. Totally. Okay. I thought of another one. It's in a bull market. Everybody thinks they're a genius. (laughs) (laughs) And and I think that's especially relevant right now because we've been in a bull market for 10 years. So the vast majority of us who have been in this market for 10 years have seen some gains. Let that not be the source of hubris. I saw a blogger, uh, uh, actually a blogger slash journalist who stopped doing her market tracking. She was trying to, she was trying to play this game where she beat the market by picking some of the best stocks and she was losing. And what was funny was she concluded after I think seven years of this, that it can't be done. And I'm like, we're still in the same long market cycle, but she had this long expose about how, you know what, um, you just can't beat just buying an index and and sticking with it. And I think we're going to see things change a lot the next time the market goes down. Brandon, you've got the last one here. What's one that's worked for you? I got three quick ones for you. So to Len's point, one that um, stuck in my mind as he was talking was um, it's not about timing the market. It's time in the market. Yeah. Very similar to one he said. And uh, Paula said one which reminded me of one I like. Something to the effect of smooth seas never made a skilled sailor. All right. So I like, I like that. that one. But one that I've had on my wall in my office coming down the corridor with large font stickers on the wall uh, is one that I really like. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's what I you know, kind of live by. And I treat my friends and my family and my clients like. So anyway, that's one of my favorites. This is going to be fun. We are throwing out the Friday FinTech segment today. You know why? Because we had Robert Niles on on Wednesday from Theme Park Insider. If you missed that and you're wondering what fun stuff to do this summer, what's going on at regional theme parks and national theme parks this summer, Robert Niles, always a great interview, and he definitely brought it on Wednesday. But today, we're going to finish that trend by talking about the mouse because as you may know, the mouse cost about 16 bags of money. If you're going to go there, you want to make sure you get value from the things that you do. And I talked to so many people who dislike Disney and then you hear about their Disney experience and you think, well, you kind of, you kind of did it wrong. I got to tell you from the first time I went to Disney till now, I have learned so much that has made it so much more fun to go there. Disney World and Disney Land are two places that uh, the more you know, the better that vacation gets. And obviously, the best use of uh, the money that you spend there. So we'll talk about value, discounts, getting the most fun with somebody who is the only person I've met so far in our space who matches my net level of uh, Disney nerdery. Bethany Bayless from the Money Millhouse. And also she is the FinCon MC, an industry conference that uh, I go to every year. Let's say hi to her right now. Bethany Bayless coming down to the basement to talk Disney. Here is somebody who I think equals me when it comes to all things Disney World and Disneyland and somebody who also like me when she sees these 15 things you don't know about Disney lists like me. She also already knew them all from the Money Millhouse podcast, the MC of FinCon. It's my good friend, Bethany Bayless. Joe Salcihai, what an introduction. 
Thank you so much. <laughs> Did I said you're as big a nerd about Disney yes, as me? A Disney nerd, loud and proud. I totally am. And another thing that I look is, you know, the hidden Mickeys? I know yes. probably most of those two. I'm such a nerd when it comes to even those. We know all of the obvious ones. We even got the book and tried to find them using the hidden Mickey book. Like we bought the damn book. And uh, yes. still had trouble finding them. Like at the uh, Wilderness Lodge, uh, when they say that they're hidden in the fireplace, I can't find those. I've stayed at the Wilderness Lodge four times. Can't find them. So if you want to know where to find Joe when going to Disney World, just go look at the fireplace <laughs> at Wilderness Lodge and you will find him. That's right. So let's start this off because we don't have a ton of time. Let's start off by talking about tickets. Robert Niles and I on Wednesday talked about, you know what, if you're looking for discounts on tickets, pretty darn hard to find discounted tickets to Disneyland or Disney World. Do you got anything? Oh, I got something. I got two big tips for everyone. The very first one is unfortunately not for everyone. However, I do think that it's one of the best kept secrets and the best deals of Disneyland and Disney World, which is if you are in the military, if you have a military ID or if you have friends with someone in the military, they offer special military park hopper deals at both Disneyland and Disney World, and they are by far the best deal in the entire park. Wait a minute. So that last part, I get being a member of the military. I get mm -hmm. being a family member. You said also friends of somebody in the military. That is correct. So if you have a friend with a military discount and they are going to Disneyland with you, then they can get you a ticket also. Oh, so OG is a Marine. Um, yes. But then I got to take OG. That's correct. So the best practices, I would say, so what happens is you have to buy the ticket together. Mm -hmm. And then as you enter the park, he has to show the ID. So the idea is that you are going with a military friend or family member. It's not something that you call up somebody who was once in the military and say, hey, you want to drive two hours to meet me and give me your military discount? <laughs> Maybe not the best approach. <laughs> And maybe not why they created the system in the first place. Exactly. So let's honor the reason why they created the system, which is for military members and their families to be able to take part at much, much cheaper rates. Let's talk about things you need to do planning your trip, because the thing that frustrates me when I see family spend the huge amount of money it costs to go to Disney World or Disneyland, I see these people in the park and they're miserable. And I'll give you an example. I was on the car ride in Tomorrowland. Is it the Tomorrowland Speedway? The Autotopia? Autotop it's called Autotopia in Disneyland. Yes. Disney it might be that one. Yeah. And they have, at Disney World, they have a Fast Pass. The Fast Pass system at Disney World is free. We'll talk about Disneyland, I'm sure, in a little bit. Yes. Because that's a little bit different system. But at Disney World, it's free. I was at the start of the line. And I'm walking through the fast pass line and I'm almost to the front. And this guy grabs my arm as he's standing in this super long line and goes, excuse me, how much did you pay for this fast pass thing? And it's like four o'clock in the afternoon. And I said, nothing, it's free. And his wife hits him on the arm and goes, I told you it was free. I told you. <laughs> I love this. Number one, I think that leads into a really great tip. Do your research ahead of time. Yeah. So know about the Fast Pass, and it is very different for Disney World as opposed to Disneyland. The thing is, with the Disney World, it's totally free. But if you are staying on park, if you are staying on the resort, it is 60 days in advance for Disney World that you can make your reservations. And I'm telling you, I'm on the, e I'm on the West Coast, not the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast. I woke up. 60 days ahead of time at 3.30 in the morning so that I could have a game plan at 4 a.m. to get my, my Fast Passes. Know which one which rides need the Fast Pass the most. And that really helps with research. And that there is not a lack of resources available to you online because there's so many. But my, my one number one tip is if you don't get a Fast Pass for the most popular ride, which right now is Flight of Passage in Pandora, the Avatar ride that they just came out with, in, in, uh, and that's in Animal Kingdom, by the way. That's correct. In Animal Kingdom. This is my, my tip for you, which was given to me by a cast member. Very hush-hush, let me tell you. Go into – there's a secret entrance in Rainforest Cafe. Did you know this? I did not know that. There's a secret entrance in Rainforest Cafe. Go through the gift shop. There's a secret entrance there. Go on a day that there is not a magic hour at the Animal Kingdom and book it to Pandora, and your wait time will be much, much less. 
Because you're way closer. You start way, way closer. closer. You start closer. You have to get there as soon as the gate opens. That's another thing. So get there whenever the park opens on a non magic hour day. That is a great Disney tip. By the way, another great Disney tip that I learned that goes right along with that, Bethany, well, as long as we're talking about uh, about getting there when the gate opens. I've been with people like, oh, I want to sleep in. This is vacation. Here's what you do. You can ride all your favorite rides, even if you don't have fast passes, if you get there when the gate opens and get it yeah. done. And by the way, leave the park at noon, go back to your hotel to like four o'clock in the afternoon and sit by the pool and, and relax then, take a nap, read a book, come back at four o'clock in the afternoon and you are so refreshed and you mm -hmm. will have done so much more of the park than somebody that waits one hour and stays all day. I remember going back into the park at four o'clock in the afternoon with our kids and our family's happy. Our family's <laughs> excited for the afternoon Rested. and you are around a swarm of miserable people who are and children. Yes. The kids are angry. The parents are angry. Like this is the happiest place on earth. And nobody's having fun. So to have fun. And by the way, I know it's hard to walk away from the park. It's so hard yeah. to walk away. Yes. Yeah. But that's such a great tip. Another thing is if you are not staying on property, maybe you're visiting and you're not on property, something that I really love to do is to go and just chill out at a restaurant or coffee shop. They have Starbucks all over the place, Starbucks I, if you will. And something else is go on a ride that may not, you know, like a show or something worth cool air conditioning. Just chill out for a while and just rest even there. But you're right. Going back and taking a nap is my favorite thing to do at Disneyland. <laughs> The first ride I thought of when you said that, actually, there's two things that are really, really good at Disneyland or excuse me, at Disney World. You can because you're on the West Coast. I'll have you tell me yes. about Disneyland, but but I'm going to give you two that I thought of immediately. You tell me if you like these or if there's different ones. Number one is hugely underrated ride or show Disney's Philharmonic. Oh. Or, or, that, okay. uh, Philhar Magic, right? Is it Philhar Magic? Yes, it's, I think it is Philhar Magic. And I would totally agree. I would totally agree. I did not go the very first time I went to Disney World, but I did go the second time. So enjoyable. So incredibly enjoyable. Absolutely. But they do not have it at Disneyland. They, wow. There are rumors that they are bringing it to Disneyland. So it will grace us. Which is surprising because every time I've gone to Disney World, that theater is empty. Like nobody goes in that ride. At Disney World? At Disney World. It's, it's been practically yeah. empty every single time I've, I've. So I'm surprised they would bring it to another park. Also, uh, just a really quick tip. You know, you can fast pass Philhar Magic. And don't do it. I would suggest not doing that. <laughs> do not do it. <laughs> save, <laughs> save. Use it for Peter Pan. Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, Peter Pan, best ride. Best ride in my, one of the best rides, of course. But then Disneyland, the one I was going to say, and tell me if you agree, but because at Disney World, you have it as well. One of my favorite things to go to is Turtle Talk with Crush. Oh, fantastic. So fun. So incredibly fun. Just watching the kids interact because it's they it's real time. So they're talking to you. They're re referencing you. And it's almost as fun. It's more magical than a Facebook live. Let me tell you. And just to tell just to tell every, <laughs> barely, but just to tell everybody what's going on is that there's a screen that looks like water. It's clearly animated. And uh, the person in the room, the Disney worker in the room introduces uh, Crush and Crush comes to the screen. It's like he's on the other side of the glass. And kids can ask Crush questions. And this animated character answers every question and tells you about the sea. It's different every time. Something really fun, if you don't believe me, which, which even if you do believe me, this is fun. Go to Turtle Talk with Crush. If there's not a huge line, go back and do it again immediately. Two totally different shows. Yes, absolutely. Another really good one is the Monsters, Inc. show. The Laugh Floor? The, the Laugh Floor. The Laugh Floor. We don't have that at Disneyland. We have a full-on Monsters, Inc. ride, but the Laugh Floor is hilarious, and they read your jokes, and then they highlight people in the audience. Another really great one just to chill out. I uh, During the show, you know, they have these monsters, the twins, that are – they have, it is two – it's a monster with two heads, but they're Siamese twins, right? So they're attached. Yes, they're linked together. Yes, yes. They shone the spotlight on me and told me to dance, right? Yes! And so I didn't get out of my seat. I just started moving my hands and I went like this and they said, wow, that really, that guy really gets down without getting up. <laughs> it was, it was. They're so quick. It They're was so fun. It was so good. But let's get back to it. Oh, yes. oh, 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 another one in, in animal kingdom. 
and and this is packed and it's well worth it. I think the uh the Lion King show. Oh, <gasps> so good. I just did the Lion King show for the first time the last time I was at Disney World in April. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Not what I was expecting whatsoever. Actually, this is a fun tip. There's a dining package that you can get at several of the restaurants in Animal Kingdom that will give you front row tickets to the Lion King show. And oftentimes those are a part of a Disney dining package. So if you've purchased the Disney dining package, you can go have dinner and a show all a part of that. Let's talk about dining because a lot of people to save money, go cheap on food. Frankly, The Disney restaurants, different than any theme parks I've been to, I think Universal has one uh, restaurant I like, maybe two. One of the ones in uh, Harry Potter World I think is okay, but the Mythos restaurant I think is fantastic. But Disney is full of great restaurants. Yes, absolutely. We just go to Disney and eat. It's a really great thing we're walking around so much because we just eat such delicious food at the resorts themselves, wherever you're staying. This is my suggestion. If you want to go cheaper, pick a meal once a day and go experience one meal. It could be breakfast, lunch, splurge on dinner, but something that I have found to work really well. If you go and let's say you have a large family of five, six people, that's a lot that adds up, right? Over time, it really adds up. Sure. If you aren't staying on a resort, if you're not staying on the resort itself, consider getting something like a VRBO, an Airbnb, home away. That's a really great way to get a house that has a kitchen in it. It's a lot cheaper than getting however many rooms you need to get on a resort or even a villa or something like that. So first you're saving on rooms. Then you have a kitchen where you can make a meal or go back in the afternoon, make sandwiches, get things. And it really, really, really cuts back. But allow yourself to have one meal a day in the park. Another option that maybe may or may not work for your budget or it could be something that you want to save for is the dining plan. And so there's a lot of information out there. There's three different dining plans. One is quick service. One is deluxe, which is a a mixture of quick service and table side. And one is all table side, signature restaurants, the whole deal. My husband and I, the last time we went, we got the middle one. So it had a quick service. It had table dining and it was perfect for us. And so consider one of those and you will get such good food while you're there. Plus, whatever you don't use, you can take back in snacks. And so there were quite a few things we just didn't take advantage of. We went to our hotel gift shop and just loaded up on tons of snacks for the road. It was perfect. Using your dining plan stuff. Using the dining plan because you can cash out. Don't leave money on the table or don't leave snacks on the table. I will I will match that with another tip. You want to go into the restaurants because of the fact that that uh, even though some people think they're expensive, the service is always fun. The, the places are decorated so cool, like every one of these restaurants decorated so neat. Just that experience. But a lot of these restaurants offer a cheaper lunch menu. So make mm-hmm. the lunch menu, if you're not on the Disney dining plan, use lunch as your big meal so you can get the experience, but you're not yeah. going to pay the dinner prices. Exactly. And that's exactly what we did for Be Our Guest. We went to lunch instead of dinner. And that was something that we booked ahead of time because it was a really fun experience. You're in Beast's Castle and you get to see like the snow coming down. It was just a really, really great experience. Which uh, they have three different rooms in Beast Castle. They have the dark room where the rose is and it's wilting. You can see it. And, and, and the wallpaper is torn off. There's the ballroom. I don't remember what the third room is, but but which uh, which room did you stay? Did you go in? Wait, I didn't realize there were more than one room. See, I need to learn more about Disney World from you. I'll teach you about Disneyland. But we stayed where we could watch the snow falling because yeah. it was just very magical. Like yeah. I felt like I was in the middle of wherever uh, watching the snow, wherever yeah. it's supposed to be set. I felt like I was there. Yeah, we went to the dark room. The, the very yeah. the very dark spot. And we did it for breakfast. So we did breakfast, which is cool. We got a reservation for before the park opening, timed it so that when we got out of breakfast, we were already at the back. Then Peter Pan, also my favorite ride, super long line for Peter Pan. I could get on it without fast passing it because I was at the back of the park pretty close to it. And we went to Peter Pan as our first thing and uh, and went from there. So that was our oh, that's great. Strategic. By the way, at Disneyland, there is no fast pass for Peter Pan. 
Well, you just have to wait in line. And 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 by the way, let's talk about the Fast Pass system at Disneyland because yeah. it is different yeah. and you have to pay for it. Uh, yes and no. Okay, so the Fast Passes are free. However, you cannot get them in advance. There's no limit to the amount that you can get, and everything is done the day of. So what you can do for free is what you have to take your pass. Or what we don't—they don't have the magic bands at Disneyland, and so you have to go in person to the Fast Pass kiosks and just slide your ticket, and then you get a Fast Pass ticket that tells you when to come back, et cetera, et cetera. The downside to this is one: you have to run all over the park if you want to get a Fast Pass, which you could totally do. Tell your kids to do it, right? Like, go on, Bobby, get this one. Sally, go get this one over here. You can only have one Fast Pass at a time, and it is good until the fast pass starts or two hours after you get it. Gotcha. So let's say your fast pass was for the evening. You can get another fast pass two hours after you get the fast pass. So you can get your ticket, swipe it, and then get the fast pass. If it's not for that evening, let's say it was a really popular ride and it's not for several hours later, you can get another fast pass two hours after you got that first fast pass, even if you haven't ridden the ride yet. However, where what you can pay for is called a max pass. A max pass fast pass is what you can pay for. It is $10 a day per ticket or $75 for annual pass holders. So I got it for $75. The benefits of this is you do not have to run around the park. You can fast pass any ride in any park. So let's say you're at Disney California Adventure and you want to go fast pass Star Tours in Disneyland. You don't have to run across the entire parks, multiple, to get your fast pass. You can do it from your phone, from the mobile app. $10 a day per ticket. You can do them all at the same time, which is super convenient. Another really beautiful thing is that if you have the max pass, you get free pictures all day long. And that includes any time you're taking a picture with a photographer and any ride that you go on are free. You can download them to your phone. You can share. So even that I think is worth the max pass pay of $10. But it does start to add up if you have a large family, if you're going multiple days, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, there's Disney people around the park that have that take pictures and we just walked right up to them and said, Mm -hmm. hey, yeah, between the pictures, the uh, being able to do it right now, 10 bucks for us. There were four of us really was worth the money. Those are some great tips, aren't they? Well, guess what? Bethany and I continue talking for a long time about Disney. So if you're interested in even more Disney discussion, hang out after the credits, wait about 10 seconds and we will pick this up as part of something that we never do, which is a discussion after the credits. So uh, hang out more for that. All right, we'll get back to the main show right now. Trivia. Who wants to do that? I don't know. that. What? Oh, it's W I. N E. There's no H in there. It's just W I N. Like the kind you drink. Okay. Okay. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And apparently, I was celebrating the wrong holiday. I thought it was National Wine Day. Did you hear the H in there? The Wine Day. It's kind of like wheat thins. Anyway, uh, I'll celebrate that tomorrow. But apparently, we're pre-partying the alternate version of this game. The one involving grapes and you get a little buzzed while joe and og are great at moaning and whining let's jump into the other version here's your trivia question in 2018 how many billions of dollars did americans spend on wine we'll all tip a glass to the answer in just a moment all right we explain the very complicated rules to this game to brandon backstage brandon you think you got it I've been preparing for this moment for a long time. (laughs) For at least 30 seconds. (laughs) The score for everybody at home. We've been playing this since the beginning of the year. We're playing all year long. Uh, Brandon's playing on behalf of OG, sitting in the OG seat, which means he's in first place. Recently, Len moved into a tie for first place with six, has had a nice uh, surge lately. And Paula is hoping to start her surge this very day. Because Paula's sitting at three. So, Paula, you get to decide, are you going to take this question first in the middle or last? 
I will answer last, Joe. Huh, that is so strange. Amazing. And uh, Len, where are you going to fall on this? Middle or first? I'm going to go middle. Middle, <laughs> which means, Brandon, congratulations. You get to start things off. How many billions of dollars do you think people spend on wine? Is that globally or just here in the States? <laughs> that is Americans spend on wine. So I'm guessing... Americans in America. <laughs> I'm hoping. I don't know if it's if it's like my recent trip to France. That might make the number go up by a lot. But uh, how much do Americans spend? Wow. All right. Well, I'm going, and it's billions with a B. Billions with a B in 2018. Not millions or trillions. All right. So that narrows it down. I'm going to be very scientific about this. I'm going to say my birth date: two seventeen, two hundred and seventeen million. Hey, your birthday is February 17th? That's right. Aquarius. So is mine. What? That's my, my dad's birthday. My birthday is February 17th. Well, since I went first, you can't use that number. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but my dad's birthday is February 17th also. But awesome. to be clear, you're yeah. saying you're saying 217 billion, not million. Or okay, billion, yeah. Yeah, 217. By the way, my birthday is the right answer. February 16th, the day before your birthday. <laughs> uh, <okay. laughs> Three of us. <laughs> 24 hours apart. Yes. That's amazing. And Paula's dad there too. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that means, Len, 217 billion is Brandon's number. Hmm. Should I say 217 billion and one? <laughs> just, <laughs> oh, man. Just, just try to take away. No, I'm any, not going to do that to you. Brandon. Any chance of winning. Uh, I'm not going to do that. No, let's see. Let's just think about this realist. So I don't know. 300 million Americans. Uh, I'd say, let's say a hundred million of those are drinkers, you know, cause there's kids and other, you know, so th that doesn't count. So a hundred million are drinkers and probably mm, half of them drink wine, maybe. So that's 50 million. And let's say you have, shoot, I don't know what a bottle of wine is. I, I really don't. Cause I'm not a wine drinker. Uh, let's say $10 a bottle. So that's 50 million times 10 that's 500 million uh oh that doesn't even get me to a <laughs> houston <laughs> oh my gosh but, but they're not going to drink one just bottle. one bottle of it's wine like a year it's not one bottle so let's say they drink um half a billion and let's say they drink i don't know a bottle a week so 2.5 billion 2.5 billion that gives brandon a lot of room but uh, Paula, that puts you in a quandary. You've got two point five billion and two hundred seventeen billion. Right, right. So the question is: Do I believe that the answer is less than two point five billion, or do I believe that the answer is between two point five billion to two hundred seventeen billion? You wouldn't dare, would you, Paula? Len, <laughs> I'd like to take this moment to tell you about how much I've appreciated our friendship <laughs> over the years. You know, I heard that's past tense. <laughs> <laughs> and I continue to appreciate it, even though you may not feel the same. <laughs> so the answer that I will give, you know, I'll I'll give you a little bit of wiggle room. I'll call it 2.6 billion. Nice. <laughs> Gives so the kind of you, Paula. <laughs> so if the answer is 2.5 billion, 2.55, then, you know, you'll have one. Welcome to the cutthroat nature of our panel, Brandon. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> right there. This is some serious <laughs> right here. I have to say for context that last week I could have won if I had just put my answer at one dollar, but you... I didn't. And I learned a lesson. You okay, could... Paula, Paula, uh -huh. if the yes. answer is 2.5 billion, if it's between 2.5 billion and 2.6 billion, uh -huh. you're coming to my, you have to come to my house and cook me dinner. <laughs> and I will bring a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now we got Deal. Now, our first show ever with side bets. <laughs> I like the side betting going on here. As any self-respecting podcast would do, we're going to make you wait for the answer. So we'll have it here in just a minute. Well, I talked about this on Wednesday, two days later, still like it exactly as much. Thanks to Ting for supporting Stacky Benjamins. I already know because I sit here looking at my phone usage and how I use almost all of it from here in the basement where we have Wi-Fi, that my phone bills are about to go through the floor. And you know why? It's all because I switched to Ting. And whenever you talk to somebody about switching devices, you think it's going to be hard. Maybe you don't. 
at least I do, but it sure was easy. Here's the deal. You can always bring your number to Ting. That made it easy. They're not a prepaid cell phone company. At the end of the month, you're just billed for the talk, text, and data levels that you reach. The less you use, the less you pay. You can use your same phone, most probably, even the latest ones like the iPhone XS or the Galaxy Note 9, and you'll still have an affordable phone bill instead of that thing going through the roof. And if you're around Wi-Fi like I am, why would you pay for a set data plan with Ting? You just pay for your actual usage at the end of the month. Ting offers nationwide LTE coverage on both T-Mobile and Sprint, so the phone you already own is likely going to work with Ting. Just grab a SIM card from the Ting shop. This was so simple. I got my card from the Ting shop, and bam, I was good to go. All done. All this stuff in my head about it being difficult couldn't have been easier. The more phones you have on one Ting account, the less you pay per phone since the usage is shared across all your devices. No contracts, so you can try it for a month with no strings attached. Of course, they offer award-winning customer support through either phone, chat, email, social media. They're also the only provider in the U.S. that offers technical support through Discord. And if you're somebody who uses Discord a lot, you know just how easy that is and how cool a company Ting is. In fact, talking to my daughter this last week about Discord, she was trying to explain it to me. I'm like, oh, I know all about Discord. You know why? Because I'm uh, the coolest 51-year-old guy you know. I don't know. I didn't say that. I should have probably said that. Brag to your kids about how cool their dad is as often as possible. Probably a good mantra. So here's the best part. We're about to save you some money. The average phone bill with Ting is just about $23 a month per phone. So that's essentially a month of free service when you use our link. You had to sb.ting.com. You know what's going to happen? You're going to get $25 off. Remember, start with SB. That's sb.ting.com. Brandon, you were first. You were at $217 billion. You got to feel pretty good about that number, knowing these two are going to war. I mean, anything north of 217, you own. Oh, now I feel like I'm way off. <laughs> I don't I don't know. That was always an OG strategy was to throw everybody off. So you might you might be in the money. We'll see. Len, you've got that uh point one billion. <laughs> I hope Paula knows how to cook some good recipes on a propane tank. <laughs> on a Bunsen burner that's in my bunker. <laughs> This will be the most epic show ever if it lands there. Paula, how are you feeling about that 2.6? I feel pretty good, but I will. I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't want to speak too soon. Well, let's have... Let's, You're the only one of us drinking wine at this moment. I am the only one drinking wine, and it's 6 a.m. We're recording this. Uh, let's, let's see. Doug, what's the answer to our question? Welcome back, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and National Wine Day is important in this house. Joe's mom cooks with wine nearly every meal. Sometimes she even puts it in the food, though. <laughs> oh, okay. Let's get you to your trivia, shall we? Hey, before the break, I asked you this question. How many billions of dollars did Americans spend on wine? The answer? Seventy and a half billion dollars. Expected more? Yeah, me too. Expected less? No. I've seen a soccer mom put that much in her cart and boxed wine on a Tuesday. Anyway, I think there's one thing we can all agree on. 70 and a half billion dineros is a lot of sour grapes. Time to toast the winners. See ya! Woo! Yeah! Yeah! I'm still in last place, but I'm just slightly less in last place than before. Yeah, in the big scheme of things, Brandon, you weren't that you were that much further off than the other two. You were just on the wrong side of that deal. I was on the wrong side. Sorry, OG. <laughs> he he will get over it, I'm sure. Paula, what are you going to do with all the winnings from this contest? Clearly, I'm going to buy a bottle of wine. <laughs> Absolutely. Hey, let's uh, take a second here and magnify somebody's money situation. Today's segment comes to us via Magnify Money. Head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash magnify money brand and you know what you're gonna find money <laughs> you will <laughs> and magnifying glasses you'll find those financial products people use every day they're nowhere near best in class over 92 percent of the products available online ranked against each other at magnify money head to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash 
magnify money for more. Whether you're trying to pay less interest to the man, have a better savings account or a checking account with lower fees or no fee, uh, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Today's uh, question comes to us from Anonymous. Say hi, Anonymous. Hi, Joe and OG. This is Amy. I really enjoy your show and I really wanted to get a free t-shirt. So I came up with this question for you guys. Here's a little bit of background. I am getting my master's degree in nursing to become a nurse practitioner. And currently, my husband and I are maxing our retirement accounts. I am taking advantage of the tuition reimbursement program offered by the hospital I work. Uh, but in the end, I still have to pay um, about $15,000 in tuition for this program. So my question is, is it better for me to lower my 403B contribution just to the match, which would be about 3%? and pay for the master's out of pocket or should I get a loan and pay off within the first year as a nurse practitioner? All right. Thanks. I am very excited to hear the answer and uh, I'm a size extra small. Thanks. We have the only show where people say, thanks for the answer. And I'm an extra small. That's, that's well, perfect. Well, I don't, I don't say I'm an extra small Joe. And that's not me. <laughs> You're in the, you, you go for the proper cloth, uh, portly section, right? Absolutely. You got it. <laughs> and I love it by the way, how my thing says anonymous and she outs herself as Amy two seconds in. So it's just an alternate spelling. <laughs> That's right. We spell it the long way. Uh, uh, Brandon, what do you think? Let's help Amy out. I think it depends on a couple factors. Um, not all of them were mentioned on her message, but I would have additional questions, but based on what we know, I definitely think she's smart to take advantage of the tuition reimbursement program. I mean, it is money on the table, so why not take advantage? That's what I did with my master's. And I think her mindset is right to keep contributing to her 403B, at least to the contribution level that she gets the match, because the match is always free money and you can't really duplicate that. But from there, I think it would depend on, you know, the loan terms, how long till she pays it off and some other simple number crunching. And what, what type of loan terms do you like? I don't know what kind of loan she's talking about, but uh, if it's a home equity loan or some other credit card balance loan, if there's a credit card balance, uh, you know, 0% interest for X amount of time, that could work. If it's a low rate of interest, a uh, home equity line or something like that, I would consider that. But um Anything double digit interest or more probably is not going to be a great deal. Yeah. Uh, Paula, anything to add? So I would almost certainly take out a loan to pay off that $15,000 and continue putting money into the 403B and then take out a loan to cover the 15000 that she needs to pay for tuition and then pay that loan off in her first year of working as a nurse practitioner. I'm assuming that she's going to be able to get a student loan. And that student loan is going to have a reasonable single digit interest rate. So if that is the case, then why not take out a student loan with a that reasonable single digit low interest while also taking advantage of the opportunity to build assets, invest, have compounding growth, you know, and just just keep putting money in a 403B, right? There's a, a maximum amount that you can put in every year. And once the year is over, it's over. You can't go back and put in more money in your 403B the following year because you didn't max it out the previous year. So put in as much money as you can into your 403B. And you know that student loan is going to be a reasonable interest rate and you're going to pay it off soon. So focus on building assets. Well, so you like it as long as she fills out the FAFSA form and it's a student loan. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't see any reason why she why it wouldn't be a student loan unless there's some reason for which she couldn't qualify for one. I just, I just don't see any reason why it wouldn't be a student loan. Yeah, I just see I just see people do weird things, which is why I wanted to clarify that because mm -hmm. people will go and take out the wrong the wrong type of loan. The the other thing too is behaviors kind of involved here, Paula. I mean, you know, you also made a point: make sure you pay it off in the first year. Like if you take out the loan, pay it off very quickly. Yeah, absolutely. So once she receives that diploma, then she will, I would assume, get a pay raise as a result of having that diploma that pay raise should immediately go towards paying off that loan. Len, uh, something to add? No, I think that, no, I think she said she was going to pay it off in the first year. Yeah. So I would, me too, I would get the loan, assuming it's a, you know, relatively low interest. Why not? And uh, go that right. You know what? I'm really, 15000 what a deal. $15,000 and she's going to be a nurse practitioner. I mean, that's a, 
pretty darn good considering all the um, the money she's going to make. The payback on that fifteen thousand dollars is going to happen very quickly. So that that's really you know my whole my engineering degree in the eighties. I spent fifteen thousand dollars my entire room, board, tuition, books. Everything, fifteen grand. I thought he was about to tell us an Uncle Len story, Paula, about going uphill both ways. Six, <laughs> six feet know, of snow. But fifteen grand in the eighties is like I don't know, two point five billion today. Yeah, no, I, don't, I don't know what that is. It's just funny how things are. But I think fifteen fifteen grand's a bargain. Wow, that's fantastic, fantastic, Amy. Well, especially since you look right now, I mean, the aging of America, the job certainty in that field. I would think, assuming you find a good place to work, there's a lot of certainty in that field, don't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think the average starting salary for a nurse practitioner is a hundred grand or more. So $15,000 loan in the scheme of things probably is a easy, to, you know, easy to bang it out. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for the question, Amy. And you know what? Uh, Gertrude in the basement is just going to send you a code and you actually, you don't have to tell us what size you are, but thank you for that. <laughs> but you get to pick out your own. Head to uh, stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail and you can leave us a note on the Magnify Money line as well. That's going to do it for today, guys. This has been such a blast. Len, what's happening at lenpenzo.com? Well, hey, first off, I want to thank you, Joe, for letting me go first so I don't have to follow Paula. Um, and her great cavalcade of guests, you know, presidents and ex-presidents and all the other <laughs> stuff she Prize brings on her, her shows. So thank you, because this is going to sound really stupid after what I tell you I'm doing. This is going to – hey, it's uh, 18 fantastic facts about credit cards that you might not have known about. So stop on by. The PersistentItch.com. <laughs> A.K.A. LenPenzo.com. <laughs> Paula, which uh, Nobel Prize winner do you have uh, coming up on the show? <laughs> so we uh, a few weeks ago, we had David Bach on the show. He is the guy who came up with the phrase, don't buy lattes. And he joined us to talk about the latte factor. We now have Ruth Sukup. She is a very, very successful online entrepreneur who wrote a book about the seven faces of fear in which she describes a lot of the different types of fear that we allow to stand in our way, the fears that often have us becoming our own obstacles. So both of those, plus an episode with you, Joe, all of that is available on the Afford Anything podcast. Just search for Afford Anything in your favorite podcast player. Is that the same Ruth who had a course about writing? Yes, this is Ruth Sukup from the Elite Blog Academy. Yeah, yeah, very good course on writing. I, I haven't taken it, but I've heard excellent things about it. Yeah, I very, very much liked it. I took that a, a while ago. That was that's that's been a while, but she definitely knows her stuff. That's cool. Brandon, thanks a ton for hanging out with us, man. Thanks for uh, having me on. There's a lot of space down here in this basement, more than I thought. There, is, there is. A, well, when OG's not around and lounging and taking up all that uh, room, it's it's much better. Tell us what's going on at the practice and how people can find you. Oh, man. Well, you put me behind Paula, so my life sounds really boring compared <laughs> to what she has going on. I usually spend the Monday of Memorial Day catching up in the office. Other than that, I'll be chasing my three-year-old and one-year-old around the parks and uh, maybe do a little potty training. Uh, but that's going to be my weekend. But um, in general, yeah, my website is Trust Tree Financial. I'm active on all the social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest. Um, but Going to Trust Tree Financial is a good start. I like I love that name, by the way, Trust Tree Financial. How did you come up with that? Well, I couldn't find a single word name in front of financial. So I determined um, that I needed to merge two words together. I racked my brain for, uh, I don't know, three or four days. And then I presented some of the choices to my wife. And she picked out Trust Tree with the first words out of her mouth. And uh, that was it. Had a nice ring and I just ran with it. Well, but also based on the stuff that you said is on the walls of your office, I think it kind of goes along with your overall philosophy. Yeah, I wanted it to be, I mean, in, in this business, a lot of us are in the same neighborhoods. We're selling the same products, working for similar companies. So at the end of the day, it does come down to trust. So uh, that word means a lot to me and to my clients. And uh, the fact of tree and growth and thriving and you know nurturing a tree, I just thought trust tree was a nice... Uh, New word that I created or my <laughs> wife created. <laughs> well, and, and the persistent itch was already taken. So, <laughs> <That's> probably, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't use that one. Right. Yeah. yeah well, my financial planner's over at the persistent itch. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> 
How do you like him? He's like a rash. Right. Yeah. Probably not great. We will link to Trust Tree Financial. We'll link to everything Paul has got going on at Afford Anything and to Len and the Persistent Itch or at LenPenzo.com on our show notes page at StackyBenjamins.com. That's going to do it for today. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? So what did we learn today? First, take some advice from the gang and surround yourself with some great money quotes to keep you motivated. What are some of your favorites? Second, take some advice from our Magnify Money Call with Amy. Paying down debt is never a bad idea, but when in doubt, check out the interest rate on your debt versus the rate you'll earn saving the money instead. You may come out ahead faster by not paying off the debt. Sounds crazy. But the big lesson? Don't let that Opre guy get near the fruit tray. Hey, Brandon, the fruit tray is for the real help around here, not the once-off guys. Got it, pal? Special thanks to Brandon Opre for joining us. You'll find more about Brandon and his financial planning practice at TrustTreeFinancial.com. Thanks also to Bethany Bayless for joining us. You'll find the rest of Joe and Bethany talking about Disney after these credits. Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com and Afford Anything Podcast. All the Afford Anythings. Len Penzo appears courtesy of LenPenzo.com. And thanks finally to all of you. Pop the wine for yourself this weekend. Or, you know, grape juice or just water. That's probably the best. Toast yourself with water. Leave the wine for me. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm a lot deeper than you realize. In fact, sometimes I just stand in front of my mirror and reflect. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. It's called the medium sketch. The medium sketch? Yeah, it wasn't rare and it certainly wasn't well done. (laughs) If you've been skipping all over the show, you might have missed this. Bethany Bayless and I earlier were talking about Disney. That discussion got so long and was so interesting, I decided not to cut it but instead decided to put it for people at the end of the show that really want more. Cause obviously Bethany and I had a far more in the way of tips than I thought. So here's the rest of my discussion with Bethany Bayless about Disneyland and Disney world tips. So the things you have to do ahead of time, you should get a restaurant or, or you should fast pass. Let's talk about that. Do your fast pass homework at Disney world. You can't do it. Mm-hmm. Like you said, at Disneyland at a time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Uh, You should also do your restaurant reservations at a time because of the fact that most of these restaurants, you can't just walk up. So many Mm -hmm. people know you can book in advance that they don't even really accept walk-ups. You're going to wait forever. Exactly. And then third, where you're going to stay. Exactly. Where you have to stay is a really big one. The food that you're going to have, I would also plan on scheduling that in advance. Something else that I don't know about you, Joe, but when I go to Disney, I am all decked out in my Disney stuff. Right. Oh, you know, I have the leggings, I have the shoes, I have the ears, and I have different shirts for different days. Oh, boy. All right. This is something else you have to plan ahead. This is my tip if you are trying to save money. Don't buy merchandise at the park. I know that's really hard to say, and you can budget ahead of time if your heart so desires and you have to have it from there. So many vendors selling Disney things for a lot cheaper. So Etsy has people making custom ears. You know, Joe, you could get custom ears with like maybe headphones or something because you're a podcaster. I don't know. Something like that. But make sure that you get your merch ahead of time. Pack it with you. Wear it on the plane so that everyone knows where you're going. And there's a lot of of available options online. But that's something else you should do ahead of time. Let's just walk through this. We talked a lot about places to eat. We talked a lot about rides. 
let's just in each park, both sides of the United States, let's mm. talk about your favorite ride and your favorite restaurant in each one. Just one. And by the way, some people are listening to this and they're thinking, man, this sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it really is fun. I mean, if it, it might not feel fun at first, but doing all that is made to make your life so much easier when you get there. One thing I will not do that I used to do, I used to plan like my route and do these. And people will sell these, these like plans where ride this, ride this, ride this for maximum. Forget all that stuff. Just go, oh my and, goodness. go and have a good time. You have yeah. to know what you want to ride first, though, which rides are going to be most popular and get to those when the park opens. So you can get three of them before most people are in the park. But besides that. I wouldn't stress it too much, but let's start off with, let's start off with Disneyland must Mm. ride at Disneyland and uh, favorite restaurant at Disneyland. All right. This is good. My favorite ride of all time is Peter Pan. I would say try Peter Pan. I like going there sometimes first if I want to get there, but I know it's going to be at least a 45 minute to an hour, sometimes more wait for Peter Pan. So if you really want to get that ride, I would suggest doing that one first restaurant. This is a big one. The Blue Bayou in Pirates of the Caribbean is the number one restaurant for Disneyland. That's one you're going to have to get at least three months in advance. And it's very, very cool. As children, and the, the Peter Pan ride has these little boats that just go past the Blue Bayou restaurant. And as children, you just think, I want to eat there one day. That looks like such a great restaurant. And it's dark and has these lights and it's expensive kind of and beautiful and just an experience. So the Blue Bayou is the number one most coveted restaurant reservation of all time. I will second that one. I'll change the ride because Peter Pan's my favorite ride, but I like the one at Disney World so much better. Okay. But, okay. <laughs> well, because there's some cool and don't fast pass it because there's stuff in the queue. Uh, the queue now goes through the kids' bedrooms and it is awesome. It is f- the, just waiting in line at Peter Pan is cool. My favorite restaurant, Blue Bayou, I totally agree. My favorite ride there, I think Pirates of the Caribbean is so much better at Disneyland than at Disney World. I agree. I 100% agree on that. If we had a totally different show where we compared the rides at Disneyland as opposed to Disney World, I would agree on that one. (laughs) And I sadly would agree on Peter Pan. California Adventure. California Adventure, the number one ride that I would suggest getting a Fast Pass for would be the Cars Land Cars ride. Radiator Springs is what it is called. It is the longest line of the entire day, thankfully because of Guardians of the Galaxy, which is also another great ride, but not my number one. Guardians of the Galaxy has thankfully taken away some of that traffic because you used to not even be able to get a fast pass unless you were there within the first 10 minutes of the park opening for Radiator Springs. But that's an excellent ride. It's so much fun. You will have have you ridden that one? I have not. It it, it wasn't built (gasps) yet when we went there. (sighs) Well, when you come back, you (laughs) definitely have to ride. It's so much fun. You're in a race and you like ride and it goes. And you feel, I can't, I can't even tell you. It's just so much fun. So that's my number one ride. My number one place to eat is a little bit harder because I feel like there are things that are changing in Disney California Adventure. So some of the restaurants that they used to have, they don't have any more. And so I just haven't been eating lunch there. I'm sorry, Joe. Did I fail you? No, that's fine because you've got a lot of restaurants out on the walkway right outside of the park. Um, so oh, yeah. You, you could just exit the park and you are in downtown Disney. So you've got plenty of choices out there. The other great thing about Disney California Adventure is oftentimes they'll have little shacks of food that you can try. So something to do, especially during the food and wine or holidays or anything like that, they oftentimes will have just samples of different kinds of food from different places that you can go and just eat your way through Disney California Adventure. So maybe that's another reason why I can't pick just one restaurant because I just love going and trying different things at these different little food checks. Neither one of these are things that I've done, but they're the ones that I'm most excited about. Number one, I super like the, um, I have heard great things about the nighttime show at California Adventure. It's so good. With, it's so good. With the fountains where they make it. Yes. They do everything on with fountains. It's uh, similar to what was the one? Um, the one at Animal Kingdom where they kind of project things on the water. It's kind of similar. Like you get some sort of yeah. feels, but it's much more magnificent in my opinion. Like I just feel like it's 
bigger World, and it's different. It has it, a different feel. And it's called World of Color. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I've always wanted to try Wine Country Tertoria. It looks neat from the outside. I'm not sure if it's good or, ba- or bad, but it's one I've always wanted to go to. Let's go to the Florida parks. Let's start with the Animal Kingdom. Tiffin's. I haven't been there yet. It is the best, hands down, my favorite of all time. Is that exaggerating? I don't know. It's amazing. Lou Mangiello. It is Lou Mangiello from WDW. Yes, Lou Mangiello, a friend of mine. I love his podcast, WDW. Tiffins, he talks about all the time. I could not get in because we didn't do our, we didn't do it ahead of time. I really like Yak and Yeti. I think Yak and Yeti is just pretty fun. I have never been to Yak and Yeti. Yeah, good stuff. And the ride, Flight of Passage. just the, Hands down. Just the best ride of all rides. Of all rides. Do we even have to go to the other parks? Because I feel like those are my number one for the whole park. There, there is no better one. But let's go to Epcot. And I got to tell you, if you haven't eaten at one of the signature restaurants at Epcot, you are miss. There are so many at so Epcot many. that are phenomenal. Just phenomenal restaurants. Your favorite restaurant ride at Epcot. I have to look it up, Joe. It's the, it, what's the, the, the one in, it's in Mexico. It's like Mikasa. Yeah. The one, the the one in the Mexican pavilion, you go inside, it looks like you're outside. So it looks like you're sitting underneath a, uh, uh, stars and there's a volcano in the distance and the river ride is going by. It's called San Angel Inn. Yes. So the San San Angel Inn is the one. They have compared that to the Blue Bayou because there's a little boat that goes by. It makes you feel like it's nighttime. It makes you just have this atmosphere that I thought was just so fun. And I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, I think that one's fantastic as well. I'm going to go with the Rose and Crown Pub in England. I think I think that's a really fun restaurant. I also like, you know, I've been to Benihana. It's kind of like Benihana, but the restaurant in Japan that's like that is is also. No, I'm taking back both of those. <laughs> I like the pizza restaurant in Italy, uh, the one right at the back. Not the big expensive restaurant, but the kind of fresh pizza one uh, in the Italy pavilion. Fan- okay, I feel like this is not fair because Epcot is the land of eating. It is. It totally is. There, because yes. that was another really great one. Is the one in France? Is that little? I totally agree. Uh, it, it, the bread, the French onion soup. It just and the beautiful thing is that the people who serve you are from these countries, and so I feel like I'm getting that extra culture, extra culture, that that cultural experience of being in these places while still being in America. The another shout out is to the Werther's original caramel shop. Delicious in Germany. It is the best caramel. I, I splurged and got like 10 snacks from there, like caramel bars and pecan bars and caramel popcorn. It's so good. Via Napoli, by the way, is the name of, of, of the restaurant. Uh, Via Napoli is the one that I like, the pizza well, place. I'm going to have to go to that one next. No, it's so good. Uh, best ride at Epcot. I really liked, is it Racetrack? Yeah, Test Track. Test Track, the one where you're in the car, that one was really fun, and it reminded me of Radiator Springs. Yeah, Test Track is really good. Not my favorite. I'll go with Soren. I think. Oh, Soren's a classic. I think Soren Around the World is because now they have two different ones. I think it's still Soren over California. In no, it isn't. They changed it. Nope, they changed it. However, this is the difference, and it's really fun. and, And I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for people, but at the end of Epcot. You know how you're going around the world, you're going to all these different places, and then you end up at Epcot? Yeah. In California, does California Adventure, at the very last scene is you go over Disneyland oh. instead of Epcot. <laughs> and it actually really surprised me when I went to Epcot. And I was like, oh, I thought it was going to be Disneyland, but it's Epcot, which Ta-da. was so much fun. And by the way- And the- there's a hidden Mickey in there. Is there really? Hmm. There's, there's multiple, but one of the ones for at both is the fireworks make a hidden Mickey in both- Epcot and Disneyland. So this concept for people that don't know what we're talking about is that uh, Disney Imagineers and Disney workers put things that make uh, the Mickey Mouse ears and the Mickey Mouse face together and they do it on purpose and you start discovering them. And at first you think, wow, that's an accident. Turns out it's not an accident. There's nothing is accidental at Disney. I will say this before we move away from Epcot, the frozen ride, which always has a line a mile long. And 
you know, little kids love that thing. Well worth it. I thought it was, I thought it was a pretty cool ride. I haven't gone on that one. Yeah. I missed it both times because there's such a long line and you almost, why. And, and unless you get your fast pass, like the first day, you're not going to get a fast pass either. It's very difficult Don't, to get a fast pass for that or flight of passage. Flight of passage. Big, the biggest rides you need to wake up at four o'clock in the morning. If you're on the Pacific coast time, <laughs> by the way, but I was going to say, you know, what was the biggest disappointment for me uh, for a ride that I waited way too long for. And maybe it's her- a heresy because I'm from California and not like an original Florida Walt Disney Worlder is um, Spaceship Earth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so creepy. I, I was d- so creeped out. I fall asleep almost every time. Yeah. So if the wait is longer than five minutes, just move on. Yeah. Yeah. Keep walking. Go eat something. Late in the afternoon, usually that line is gone. It's always yeah. everybody wants to go when they first come in because it's the first thing they see. So people flock to it, walk right by it, do that one later. Uh, great advice. All right. Let's move over to Hollywood Studios. Hollywood Studios for me, people say there's not good restaurants. Those are all some of my favorite restaurants. Really? Yes. I have to give you the disclaimer here. I have not eaten in Hollywood Studios. Okay. Okay. Uh, ride, yes. though. Ride is the Star Star Tours. I love Star Tours. But I didn't go when Toy Story was open, and I didn't go when Star Wars Galaxy, Edge, Edge of the Galaxy. Yeah. So those might really determine, but I just am a Star Wars geek. I, I haven't seen the, well, the Star Wars stuff isn't open yet, but the, um, but I really like the Slinky Dog Dash. Uh, it is, it is super good in the new Toy Story land. Uh, so you got to do that next time. Rest, All right. rest, next time. Restaurant wise, it's so close, but I think I'm going to give it to the fifties primetime cafe because you go in and they tell you, uh, uh, we'll tell mom you're here, go have a seat in the living room. And then so you go and you're in this 50s plastic living room, the black and white TV and all this kitschy 50s, 1950s stuff. And then they they always call you uh, like cousin Bethany, cousin Joe, uh, your table's ready. We go to our table and we have our cousin so-and-so who's our helper, who's our, our waiter. And then we also have somebody who does the who does the water. And this is horrible. This is from several years ago, and they probably don't do this anymore. But the first time I went, we had this hilarious waiter, and she said, she leans forward and she goes to my kids. She goes, now, Cousin Lenny does the water. He's, if you remember, he's kind of slow. So whenever, whenever he comes up with the water, just don't look him in the eye. <laughs> And so, and so Lenny would come up and our kids would start giggling, looking away and Lenny would pretend like he didn't know. And he would go, what, 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 what? And of course, as a dad, I didn't finish my plate. And so the woman went to take my plate away and said, are you finished? And I said, yeah. And immediately I went, oh no. Cause she said, ladies and gentlemen, this dad here should be setting a better example for his kids. Take some of the peas. Cause of course they have like, uh, um, meatloaf and peas yes, and yes. all kinds of stuff takes my peas and has everybody in our area make the choo-choo noise while <laughs> she feeds me peas and my kids ate it up my kids thought it was great uh view master uh use a view master for your desserts they're all on, on that it is it's great but i also like the, the i also like the the sci-fi diner the way oh. you go into this place and everybody sits in these model cars that they're supposedly cars. So my kids sat in the front, Cheryl and I sat in the back and waiters on roller skates bring you stuff while you watch on this big screen, Amazon women from the Arctic uh, uh, or, or from Mars or, you know, giant spiders from hell, like all of these classic bad, bad, bad science fiction movies are just, just awesome. So you're making me reconsider Hollywood Studios because we went there and we were just kind of like, all right, well, this is clearly the smallest park. It has the newest stuff. So it's the most crowded. So it has the most people for the least amount of space. And it's just it's one of those ones that we kind of did in half a day. So I need to go back and I need to give it a better chance. And I also have to add this. Guardians of the Galaxy originally used to be the Tower of Terror, which is a fantastic. They then converted it into. Yeah. Fantastic ride. 
And so if you want to get the true Tower of Terror, you now have to go to Hollywood Studios to get the original Twilight Zone feel because it's never coming back to California. Yeah, it's, it, it is really good. But I will say that park, if you're going to skip a park, it still is the one to skip until Star Wars gets there. It still is the one. It is so small. And they've closed a bunch of shows and haven't opened new ones. They used to have all kinds of like actors walking around and it really was really had a lot more theme. Um, th- they just changed the great movie ride. It's coming back as a Mickey and Minnie's adventure, but that's not open. Like so oh. much of that, so much of that park is not open. I used to, they used to have the animation studio open. You did this huge tour. They had a backlot. That's all gone. Like the, it's the, so sad. Yeah, it is sad. It's yeah. That park is still not, uh, not great. All right. Last one, save the best for last, which is the magic kingdom. The Magic Kingdom. Did we already name our favorite ride? Yes. So I guess we got to do our second favorite ride then. Well, we cut it. Well, we did it for Disneyland because Magic Kingdom and Disneyland are very, very similar. And so I'm just going to say Peter Pan is still my favorite ride in the Magic Kingdom. Well, well, Peter Pan's my favorite ride at the Magic Kingdom, but my favorite at Disneyland is Pirates of the Caribbean. Exactly. But at the Magic Kingdom for me, it's uh, Snow White's. Dwarf Mine Train. Yes. The Seven yes. Dwarfs Mine Train. Oh, it is so good. Can I change my ride to that? Can I change it to that now, please? <laughs> yes, yes. Another one that you need to fast pass. So I, the ones that we did is the Dwarf Mine Train, the which is also very fun to stand in line. That was the other thing about Disney World that I appreciated a little, just a tiny bit more than Disneyland because the standing in line part is so much fun. Even the waiting, they want you to be engaged. They want you to have fun. Even walking around, everything around you is just so magical. And I think it was intended on that way on purpose. So that yeah. if you're walking from one place to the next, you're still experiencing the magic. And the Disney Mind Train has some really fun things to do while waiting in line. Totally agree. Yeah. So what's going on at the Money Mill House? Well, the Money Mill House, we're just now taking a little bit of a hiatus for the summer. What we like to do, though, is we play our favorite episodes, like with our favorite people. Joe Saul C. High is one of them. Oh, and then at the end, we give our commentary. So we listen to the episodes, and then my mom and I, we just talk behind the scenes, kind of like, you know, like when DVDs existed, and you would turn it on, and then you would listen to the commentary, and she's like, that's so interesting. So that's what we like to do for I- the summer. Are you saying you heckle your episodes? Yes. That's... We don't heckle, but we give a little bit of the behind the scenes of like, oh, this is what was happening. This is a story we didn't share on air, or we just give a behind the scenes it's for our friends who just like to come hang out with us. And then we're rolling out a brand new season. We're really excited for some of the things that we have planned because every season we want to try something new and we always want to be getting better. So I'm really excited that our season's going to be coming out in the fall. But again, if you haven't listened to the Money Millhouse, go listen to our, our episodes going up right now, and then you'll really get a clear, unfiltered idea of what we're like at the Money Millhouse. It is so fun, and uh, from uh, Ellie Kay's Kitchen, always a good time. Bethany, thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate you having here and letting me nerd out about Disney. It was so great. Welcome to the after show, Brandon. This is the part of the show that we don't talk about what happens in the after show stays in the after show. So just so you know, the rules and for everybody listening, we've had people talk about the after show before, and I don't know why you would break those rules. If you have to talk about it, you can mention dessert if you'd like, if you really have to, but uh, let's try not to. And one thing this, uh, Doug, it's, he so eloquently explained it's uh, national wine day tomorrow. So I was wondering, it's Memorial Day weekend, and while a lot of Americans don't imbibe, some people do, and maybe, well, even if you don't drink alcohol, you probably have a go-to drink, right? And so if you're at a party, you're at a get-together, 
you know, uh, uh, Paul is at a NASCAR race. What, uh, what, what, I'm sorry. That just sounds funny to me. Paula to NASCAR race. I love, by the way, Paula going to NASCAR <laughs> races and you need to go to one with me. Okay, let's do it. We will record an episode live from, well, it won't be live, but we'll pre-record an episode from a NASCAR race. Yeah. And as the cars go around the back stretch, we can talk and then you won't hear anything and then we'll talk again. And yeah, but, but, but let's start with you, Paula. You're at a mm-hmm. get together or a bar, a nightclub or whatever. Got like a special, a uh, special drink of choice. I do. Yeah, actually, I've got two depending on the context. One is any type of red wine and the other is uh, a Manhattan. Those are my two favorite drinks. So those are my it's context dependent, whether it's more of a wine type of event or a cocktail event. But I'll go for one of the two. Any strategy behind it? Like when you talk about kind of the context? Um. Not real. I mean, so red wine is theoretically, quote unquote, healthy for you, which I think, you know, is true if you're drinking maybe one glass in moderation. But uh, I I certainly push it to the point where it's not, you know, like I'm sure no doctor would advise drinking four glasses of red wine on a Friday <laughs> night. But hey, maybe it's slightly less bad or at least I can fool myself into thinking that. I remember the first time I went over to a friend's house to have red wine. And, you know, there's that one glass thing and red wine's now served in these like big gulp <laughs> glasses, these just huge glasses. I'm like, yeah, one glass each and we polish off a bottle. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So well, red wine is also with white wines, you run the risk that depending on the wine, it might be sweet or it might be dry. Red wine, broadly speaking, uh, you run less of a risk of just having an an extremely sweet or sugary drink. Yeah. Which is, well, I was going to ask you about the other one though, the Manhattan. When, when did you learn to like Manhattans? You know, I've always been a whiskey bourbon type of a person. Um, I grew up in Cincinnati, which is right across the river from Kentucky. So uh, I think there was just a part of me that when I started drinking, I, I just gravitated towards bourbons and whiskeys and then, but eventually like a, a whiskey Coke needed to be fancied up a little bit. So Manhattan it was. One of my favorite things the last time I was in New York was to have a Manhattan in Manhattan, just just for irony. That was yeah. purely, yeah, yeah. I felt, I mean, I felt the same way. I, I often eat the regional specialties wherever I go, like Whataburger in Texas. I thought you were saying Cincinnati. I was, but pork rinds? Oh, I had a lot of pork rinds in Texas too, actually. And H-E-B queso. <laughs> so good. Uh, Brandon. Drink of choice this uh, Memorial Day weekend. Well, for me, I think one of my go-tos is the gin and tonic. It just feels light and refreshing, and it's a perfect uh, Memorial Day drink for me. But if your question was, you know, what type of part, it depends on the party. I mean, there were phases where I would go and have tequila shots and then just a bottle of water, you know, shot water, shot water. Sometimes I like a good bourbon. But oftentimes the events that I go to have beer and wine. So I opt for the wine and, you know, red for the health benefits. So pretty boring. But if I'm going to have one this weekend, it's going to be a g and It's going to be that. Start a summer. Kick off your summer with a and <laughs> Yes. But you don't do that at the holiday party, do you? No. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's usually uh, they have the well liquor. So um, there's a difference of, of course, well and, and the good stuff. So unless I know... It's going to be a certain type, you know, I'll pass. See, he's good sitting in for OG, isn't he? Because OG is <laughs> the same kind of liquor snob that Brandon is. You guys got that in common. That's awesome. No, I'll pass. Uh, Len, how about you? Drink a choice. Well, it, it beer, of course, it's always beer is always a good go-to. But um, I tend to prefer like a blue moon in the winter and the fall. And I prefer a Mexican beer in the summer and the spring. Uh, but generally, as it gets hotter, I I prefer uh, a Cuba Libre when it comes to the uh, mixed drinks. Oh. So uh, that's a big uh, – and I have to say there's there's a difference between the rum and Coke and the Cuba Libre being the lime juice. you got to have that lime juice with the uh, Cuba Libre. So You can tell the difference. Oh, yeah. I think it, oh, it makes a big difference, yeah. 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 When did you start drinking Cuba Libres? When did I? Probably 10 years ago, I guess. It used to be my, my, before that, it was a martini. I was a martini guy. And that was with gin, not vodka. It seems like nowadays everybody wants a, a vodka martini, but uh, it used to be martinis. 
But uh, yeah, about 10 years ago, I went to the – it's just more refreshing. That lime juice and that rum, it's just oh, it's a great drink in the hot summer. Paul, I'm like you. The uh, the red wine is my drink of choice, except I will almost always choose a Cabernet Sauvignon. And when I, when I, when I realized why it was kind of funny, it's because mm-hmm. it was because of my financial planning training. I realized that that a Pinot uh, Noir has a high standard deviation. <laughs> meaning, meaning sometimes they're really good and sometimes they stink. So if, you know, I'm at a party and I'm just trying to get something and I say, give me a Pinot, it, it, it could be horrible. Mm-hmm. But a Cabernet generally it's, it, you know, isn't as good as some other wine sometimes. But I know if I'm at a party and I just want to grab something that the standard deviation is so low. Is it funny to use financial terms for this? The standard deviation is so low that I can say Cabernet Sauvignon and I kind of know what I'm going to get. Like I can get the, I can get the house one. I can get whatever. I don't have to worry about it. Just give me the house cab. I'm fine. I'm good. Mm, it's going to be more predictable. Yes. I've never heard standard deviation used when describing wine. <laughs> it's, it's yeah, very, me either. Very, very cool. A, yeah. <laughs> we I should, tell you, went full circle with that term. We, we should figure so, out. Ha- what about the other reds? Like what about Merlot? I think Merlot is a little wider, but Merlot, I just don't like Merlot as much. And then. How uh, about two buck Chuck? <laughs> yeah, zero deviation on those <laughs> you take that and you throw it right in the trash no deviation no i'm kidding and what temperature do you like your wine you know it's funny i'm not that much of a snob and i know there's a specific temperature you're supposed to have it at mine is generally off the kroger shelf how about Room you have you, ever, have you ever been at a, a restaurant you know how they pop the the wine right don't they they pull the wine bottle and then they they give you a little taste right have you ever taken a taste of it and said Ugh, <laughs> send it have you ever done that <laughs> oh you know the purpose of them doing that i i just i learned this uh... and she's frozen <laughs> <laughs> and frozen we, will, we will never know the purpose <laughs> come on paula frozen in time don't leave us hanging. <laughs> hey, you want to you want to really almost. tick somebody up? This and this is me and my buddy. This is I'll, I'll go off a of wine. And do it with steak. Yeah, we were at Ruth's Chris. Me and my buddy at a Ruth's Chris. We both ordered rare steaks, and they were medium rare. And we sent them back. Oh, and they oh that that went over like what? Well, but hey, right? You pay that much money for yes. steak. So guess what happens? You know, both of our steaks come back the second time with a manager and he's there and he watches us cut into that each of our steaks to make sure our steaks were rare. You know, I was like, it was like, whoa, this is kind of almost intimidating. I was like, boy, I sure hope the, the chef didn't uh, overdo it this time because I, I don't know what that manager would have done if I said send it back again. Yeah, but they asked you. I mean, they said, yeah, I know, they, I know, but it's just funny. The manager comes out, you know, and they're checking when they, you cut into that steak. I, I'm sure that the chef would have been fired if we sent it back again. The second time. Yeah. Well, uh, Paul is gone. I guess we'll never know guys. <laughs> <laughs> that, Bye, Paula. that ends the same way. Every stacky Benjamin show ends right there with a, who knows? Yes. Everybody do a Google search. Oh no, here she comes. Hey, I'm back. Yes. <laughs> we got you back on the short wave. So what's the, <laughs> What's, Here, what's let me, the let end me of that plug st- into a real mic. I had to go stand next to the uh, router. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just had to go get another glass of wine. That's what you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, she, and, and she has to put both arms like this for it to work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You ever had, Len, you're old enough for this, Brandon. I don't know how old you are, but I, but do you remember the days when you'd send your little brother to stand with the rabbit ears and you'd have to hold the rabbit, <laughs> hold the rabbit ears at a certain spot? Or how about this? You put, you put foil on the rabbit ears to extend it, make it even longer. Yes. You ever do that? Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. We did all those. <laughs> so, so Paula, what's the end of that story? You're leaving us hanging. So the purpose of them opening that bottle of wine at the table is not for you to determine whether or not you subjectively like it. It's for you to tell them whether or not the wine has gone bad inside the bottle. Uh Because if it's corked and it's completely rotten, you'll know right away. Yeah. And so that's really what you're there to tell them. If it's truly bad, if it's gone off, then that initial taste is, is your opportunity to flag it. Cheryl and I, early in our marriage, Shiraz had just really made its way in a much bigger way to the United States. I mean, it had been around a while, but but with more of the mass production, it had hit. And uh, and I don't know, we hadn't ordered much wine before, and we're at this really nice restaurant, and we order a bottle of Shiraz. 
the waiter brings it over and he's got his corkscrew and he has the little, uh, the little towel on his arm and he's got the bottle under his other arm, right up in his armpit and, uh, makes this big deal of spinning around the corkscrew, takes it and puts it right up against the bottle. And you hear this tink. And then he, he gives Cheryl and I this look and he takes the corkscrew, puts it in his pocket, takes his hand and shows us his hand puts it right along the, the, the neck of that bottle and does a twist and you hear, and he twists the, he twists the top off because most of the, Shiraz, <laughs> most wow. of the Shirazes are a twist top. And, and, and then we all start laughing together. <laughs> so funny. Cheryl and I go to a high end oh, restaurant, awesome. go to a high end restaurant back to the day and order the, order the twist top. Yeah. Oh, if it's white wine, I like it chilled. If it's red wine, room temperature. Do you, right. You're only you're the second and third persons that I've asked this question. Ever? Yeah. The first person <laughs> I asked was a client of mine who uh, claims to be a wine connoisseur. And he says 55 degrees for both red and white is the ideal temperature, the exact same temperature. Really? Huh. I that was news to me. And I, I don't know if that's correct or that's personal preference, but my wine... Chiller is now set at 55 and I have red and white in there. That's funny. Cause I always just naturally think of white as being, uh, you know, you want that a little more chilled than your red. I, I do like it a little bit colder too, but that's where we store it at least. But we'll see. Well, now we've got Brandon, our new wine expert on here. And that- Jeez, I need to go, I need to go Google things like wine chiller. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought- we just moved into a house with our very first uh, wine fridge. So I'm only six months into it, but it's working so far. You tell Len Penzel wine chiller, he thinks Bartles and James. <laughs> hey, you know what? I grew up with my you know, Italian family and my dad, or all my relatives, they had the bottle of Gallo, the, the big old bottle of Gallo jug wine. And it sat there right on the top of the refrigerator. That was, that's the extent of their wine. I mean, they drink a lot of wine. That's what they drink, you know, yeah. simple taste back then. All the, all the kids came up and got theirs. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. No, that's true. And when you were younger, you would take uh, your grandparents or your mom or dad would take an orange and they'd squeeze a little bit of orange, put a little sugar in there to make it more palatable for you. Yep. That's awesome. 